The Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. Again, it is my privilege and it is my great delight to welcome us all to another Bible study. And it is always so good, so refreshing to have us all meeting. Uh, for those who are not able at this particular point to log in and to tune in, uh, we are sure you will join in afterwards. And so we welcome you whatever time you come on. But it is always a good thing for us to be together in Bible study. So much for us to get into, to look at, to learn. And it is as we bit by bit study and chip away at some things and develop a love for the word that we become drawn nearer and nearer to the Lord of our salvation. And so I encourage all of us to continue to be a part of Bible study. Those that are not tuned in, get to a friend, get to a brother, get to a sister, remind them that it is important to take time out to look at some simple things, but yet profound things, because these are things that help to build our faith, in God's words, these are studies that help us to understand on our own and allow us to be able to stand in defense of the word of God and of the validity of the book that we call the Bible. It is important that you are fully convinced in your own minds that the things that are written are true they are trustworthy. You can put your necks on the block for the things that are contained in this book called the Bible that we all hold so dear to our hearts. And so I encourage us to continue to uh, you know, tune in. And I'd like to encourage us also, whenever we sit into these sessions, there are so many scriptures from time to time that we read, it is important that after the presentation, you take the time and you might jot the scriptures down, go over them. Look back at the program. Look back at this, the, the, the scriptures given. Look back at the points made and make your own notes and try as best as you can to formulate it into your own minds so that you are clear and it cements itself and imprints itself in your own mind, in your own consciousness, in your own heart. That is very, very important, saints of God. Now, we have been in the book of Genesis, and as we said uh, at the outset, you know, we, we certainly could not do everything in Genesis. The book itself spans a period of time covering over 2,000 years, from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 50. When you look at the entire book of Genesis, the period of time that it covers is over 2,000 years. So many things can happen and would have happened in that time period. So it's impossible to try to do everything in the book of Genesis. What we have done is that we took the time and we did a survey, an overview of the book from chapter 1 right down to chapter 50. We did a survey of the book outlining uh, some basic precepts and we, have, we had broken the book down into sections and show what each section, you know, section by section represented and so forth. It is important that we take time to assess and analyze the book in that way so that we can have an appreciation for what Genesis is telling us, for what is contained in the spectrum of the book. It is very important that we know that. Uh, we learned quite a bit also. We learned about the patriarchs. We learned about, it, given that the book is a book of beginnings, the name Genesis literally means beginning, the origin, it is where it all started. It gave us a good background and feel as to what transpired at the very beginning 
to cause things as we see today, you know, to be as they are. And if you want answers, know where to go, like back to the very beginning. And so it is a very interesting book for us to take the time out to study and to learn. There is just so much. And because this book takes us to the beginning, and in the beginning it spoke to the fact that God created, then it makes itself a prime target for attack by the enemies of Almighty God. Because if this book is introducing the fact that God created everything, God is the originator of life, of the heavens and the earth, of families, of nations, it all started, and the Bible said, and in the beginning, God. Then the enemies of God, the adversaries, will do everything to discredit this book so that he can wipe out of the consciousness of the minds of men the existence of God. And as we look around, brothers and sisters, that is exactly what we see happening, not only now, but it has been happening for quite a while. Over a period of time, men have come about trying to see how best they can inject thoughts and ideas into the minds of humanity that will water down, that will dilute, that will discredit the book of Genesis, especially Genesis, because that is where the introduction of the concept of God started. And so it is the book that most skeptics and atheists and agnostics, is the book that they seek to target because if they can destroy the faith of men in that book which introduces God, it didn't tell us where God came from, but it introduced him on the scene to say, God did this, and God did that. And if that book can be attacked, and the things presented attacked, and alternative solutions presented so that we now get the feel based on scientific presentations and other intellectual submissions if we then see these things and hear these things and they are repeated over and over not only that if they are introduced into our school system which is what has happened right across the globe those that have a particular agenda have infiltrated the school system, not just here in Jamaica and other places, but globally, and introduced at the lowest level the concept of evolution and that we got here by every other means except by God. What they are now doing is capturing and captivating the mind because there are those who have passed through the system that they could not grasp and get to because we were already cemented in our mindset that God made us and so they couldn't get us at a certain level. So what the agenda is, is to infiltrate and to get into the school system at the primary level and start to introduce some of the concepts that expand itself further as you go into the secondary level and the tertiary level when the average joe or jane graduates from college their concept of god is so skewed that there is no room to accept any belief that god could make humankind they have from the primary level been infiltrated in their minds that we came from Martians, that there was a big bang, that there was a great explosion and 
out of nowhere some things came together and through a process over a period of millions of years a life form came into being and it expanded itself and over time and hundreds of thousands and millions of years as one particular life form was transformed and evolved into another life form and it evolved eventually into apes and then the apes evolved essentially into humankind and yet that kind of evolutionary presentation does not even consider the fact of how intelligent the human being is how powerful the mind is it doesn't consider how everything works together in clock wise or clockwork precision it doesn't consider the beauty of the lilies and the roses in the field and in the wild it doesn't consider that noon time and evening time and morning time just comes over and over it doesn't consider that the universe works with a certain level of synchronism and timing that if second goes out so to speak it causes ripple effects in other areas the thing has got to be so precise and they attribute all this to an occurrence of chance but because it has been inculcated in the minds of our youngsters from childhood then they get to adopt it and they will defend it but we stand in these bible studies to present to us the facts as they are in the bible and i would want to use this evening to reiterate this session to reiterate this moment to reiterate that never must we as children of the most high god entertain the world view the world perception of things first and then use that to try to fit it into the bible to see if the bible can fit into what is established and what is accepted and what is accommodated by the so-called intellectuals of our land that must not be the approach of the child of god we must first understand who we are and whose we are and then do everything to take the book and understand that that book is what represent true facts and we must see the world from the prism of the book called the bible the bible must not fit into men's system and belief men's system and belief must try to fit itself in the bible because the bible is the word of god and so as we go through genesis you will find we having surveyed and given an overview of the different things that you know we, are, we would have gone through and as we did that survey we got a feel for genesis and we see god working at creation he was also already thinking about salvation and we see it reflected in the session that we did when we looked at the fact that he started with the evening and then the morning and so evening and morning was the first day and some things happened during that period in creation and we also looked at the parallel when we examined redemption and we saw that as god redeemed his people his process was evening and morning and then in that period the salvation the redemptive program of god was outlined and so we see that behind it all there had to be an intelligent mind that saw everything and then put it in order to give us a glimpse of the the synchronism and the perfection and the detail and the strategy and just seeing it all coming together and we are able to see this out coming out in the book of genesis now the skeptics look at a lot of things and make big issues out of them in an attempt to discredit the words of god they tell us that the bible could not be real because it made no mention of and it didn't even understand anything about the concept of dinosaurs 
And yet, a few weeks ago, we the took the time and went through and showed us that the Bible spoke about these massive creatures. The tail of one being compared to the cedar trees. And if we know what a cedar tree is and how huge that thing is, and one of the tail of these monsters, uh, the, the, the Bible used the term Leviathan. Yes, it used some terms, which are terms that were established long before the word dinosaur was established. Dinosaur is a new word in our lexicon. Only in the 1800s was that word coined. So prior to that word, you would not see it in the Bible because that word was not there. It's a new word. But you would have seen the word Leviathan and you would have seen some other words that Job made mention of as describing the monster both on land and in sea in which dinosaurs, depending on the species, was both a land animal and a sea animal. And it's in the Bible. The Bible describes some of these massive animals as dragons. And there were many cultures way back that spoke to dragons. And you look at pictures in the images, imprinted into the images, chipped out in stones of tribes way, way back. And you see in China, they have pictures of dragons with this long tail, some of them spitting fire. The Bible talks about the fire that comes out of the mouth of the dragon. People thought that when they saw these imprints in rock formations and in caves that dates hundreds and thousands of years back, they, they, they couldn't understand. But these are different civilizations, different people spread across the globe that have similar references to massive animal, massive creature, some of them breathing fire from their mouth. Where did these different people spread across the earth see these kind of things so that they could draw them and make reference to them? They existed and they existed at a time when people were here. Not before humankind came on earth did these animals exist. They existed while people were here. And that's why people could draw them and write about them and indicate what they saw and have imprints available even to this day that demonstrated that these mammoth creatures were around while they as humans were here. And so the Bible easily shows that and give account for these massive creatures that people in certain academic circles today would try to use to tell us that the Bible is incorrect. The Bible disproves what they have said. The Bible has shown that they are wrong and that we indeed have massive creatures written in the pages of the book of the Bible. And it is important that we understand that, saints of Almighty God. We have gone through that already, so you can look back over those presentations, make your notes, and reinforce in your own selves, in your own minds, in your own consciousness, that the Bible and that Genesis in particular, since that is what we are studying, is real, it is true, it is correct, and it reflects the true meaning of beginnings and it introduces God and God is real God is alive and God is well and he's in the book of Genesis and similarly folks uh, try to let us know that the Bible cannot be taken at face value and in particular the book of Genesis because Genesis tells us that based on what we have presented to the world that God made Adam and Eve and the agnostics and the skeptics come to us and say look here now you said that your Bible in Genesis says that Adam and Eve had two sons Cain and Abel and Cain slew Abel and so it was Cain alone that was left but then after a while uh, Adam and Eve had another son so it is now three sons and his name was Seth. So now that Abel is dead, 
it is just Cain and Seth. Yet your Bible says that Cain left and went to the land of Nod and found a wife there. They would tell us that that is just crazy and your Bible is inconsistent and it therefore is unreal and it is just a fairy tale story. But I, as we go through in this presentation, we are going to see that, oh, it's no fairy tale at all. And right in the very Bible, the answers to those very questions are there. Genesis is a book that is alive and it is important that we take time out and understand that it is credible and we can show and we can prove and we can dispel all doubts from the hearts and the minds of the people of God. Now, the other thing that have confronted us, and we will take the time this evening and get into that presentation in terms of the origin of nation and, you know, races. And, you know, so I put my finger like in quotes, races. Because, you know, the, one of the things that is asked of us Okay, so if we came from just one parents, Adam and Eve, they must have had a certain color. They must have had a certain texture of their ear here. They must have had a certain color in their eyes, whatever it was. And so we expect, as is the norm, when they have children, that the children would at least look like mother or father. In some instances, they, you know, they, they share the looks. Or in another instance, one might look so much like the father and the other look so much like the mother. So then, if we are from the same common ancestry, if our parents are Adam and Eve, why is it, we are asked, that over in India you have Indians with long hair over in North America and Europe, you have white people with blue eyes. Over in the Netherlands, you have another set of white people with blue eyes and blonde ear. Everybody here blonde. Over in Africa, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, you have pure black people with low, tough, rough hair. How did all these groups, if we came from one blood, from one common ancestry, how did they come about? See, I told you, no God thing is there. It was a process of evolution. And as they evolved, the apes and then a certain race of people. And it was during the process of evolution. In fact, it was Darwin at one point gave the impression that those that had evolved and are now Caucasians, are at probably the highest point of the evolutionary process, almost to give the impression that one race is superior, one group is superior to the other. So we don't subscribe to that. And as I told us last time, because there is a group that tells us that, you know, black people are cursed and etc., etc. That's why all of these things happen and that's why that and that. But that is not so and we have looked at that. But it is important that we take the time out to see what the Bible, because the very Bible and just the same science we will use, God opens our eyes to and shows us and they can be used along with what God has said in his words to dispel every one of the things that men would have to say to try to discredit the Bible. It can speak for itself and it has spoken for itself. And so we are going to take the time out and we are going to look at a few things as we examine the origins of nations and I just put in quotation races because the truth is there are no races. It is just one race. Adam's race. The human race. We are from common ancestors. The Bible tells us that. And so we are going to get into the slides now and we are going to just look at some scriptures and I love to use scriptures. Pardon me if you say it takes up time, but don't worry about it. 
We just want to get the gist of it and start out with the scriptures. It is important. And then afterwards, we will skip over some and you read them, you know, in your time afterwards. But I, it is important that, especially at the start, as we make the point, that as we make the points, you read the scriptures along with them so that we can see exactly how they fit together. I want us to do that. So we are going to look at the origin of nations and races and we are going to take it down the line and we are going to see a lot of things jumping out at us, coming to light and we ultimately will go into where white people, and I put that in quote, black people, and I put that in quote, and all the others in between the spectrum of white and black, how they come in, where they came from, how they got to where they were, how their skin color was like that, how the texture of the, their hair was like that. We're going to look at that. It is right there before our eyes. And you don't have to doubt the word of God, brothers and sisters. Take our time and go through Genesis, and we will see a few things. So we still have a few more things to look at, and then we see and later on now you take your time and you go through other things in genesis but let's go to the slide as we jump and dig into the origins of nations and races now the bible the bible tells us and i i, I made well before i say that the, i made the point earlier and i i reiterate it here again that it is important to have a correct world view and it is important that as we develop this worldview, that we start off with the word of God and then we build our thinking from there. Never use what is happening in the world to test if the Bible is correct. We use the Bible to test if what is happening out there is correct because the Bible is the ultimate authority. It is the word of God. Almighty God. Now there's a basic biblical perspective, brothers and sisters, that I want us to, 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 to see, that I want to present to us. Uh, we see and we make the point and we make the claim that Adam and Eve was, the, Adam was the first man, Eve was the first woman. These are facts in scriptures. I want us to look at 1 Corinthians, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 45. And then we are going to look at Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20. And it is important that we, we just take the time and briefly just to look at the scriptures because we, es we are establishing a basic fact that Adam was the first man, that Eve was the first woman because this has to be clear in our mind this is what many are trying to refute this is what many will do everything to say is a farce it doesn't exist it cannot be there is too much diversity of people now for everybody to come from one common ancestry which is adam and eve but if we believe the word of god we have to believe the word of god if we are going to run with the Bible, we must run with the Bible. So 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 45 um, tells us, and let us see if we can bring it up. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45. I, let me just read it into our earring. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, point being made, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, and this was referring to Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. So the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 is making the point in verse 45 that Adam was the first man. And this corroborates exactly with what is written in the word of God, in the book of Genesis. So, brothers and sisters, Adam was the first man. And that is a point that we wanted us to be clear on. Then, 
we go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20. And it says this simply. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So that every living human that graced the face of this earth came by way of Eve who was the first woman. So that these two scriptures establish to us that the first man was Adam, that the first woman was Eve, and we must be clear in terms of this Bible perspective, amen, of who these persons were. Now there's another point that I want us to be clear on, and it is taken from Genesis chapter 5 and verse 4, and we are going to come upon this scripture from time to time. Uh, yes, and you will see some scripture repeating themselves. Don't worry about it. It is deliberate. We put them there because the scripture speaks to a number of things. Now, I want us to notice. And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were 800 years. Right? And he begot sons and daughters. So it's very important for us to understand that there were many people around, both before Adam had Seth, no doubt, and after Adam had Seth. This man was 800 years that he spent after the birth of Seth. And in fact, when he had Seth, and we'll meet upon that later on, when he had Seth, the Bible said in verse 3 that he was 130 years when he had Seth. Now, he had Cain and Abel long before that. So that between Cain and Abel and Seth, and then after Seth, he begat sons and daughters. So I want us to remember this point. Now, as we look at the table, we see it jump down and came down to Noah and his family. Now, why did I place Noah and his family in the chart? So many things happened after that. Well, we know that in Genesis chapter 9, it tells us uh, some things that had happened prior to Noah and his family going into the ark along with, along with uh, two of every type of animal in terms of kinds of animals. And we know what happened. We realize, we recognize that the... We, we, recognize that this, yeah, we recognize that Adam and his family, along with all the other animals, were in the ark. They were saved from the judgment that came on the face of the earth. Every other human being, every other creature, every other living thing on the face of the earth, were wiped out and it was only Noah and his family and I want us to remember this and this is important now let's read it Genesis chapter 9 verses 17 to 19 I won't have us reading all the scriptures all the time but like I said since we are at the start I would want us to at least read a couple of them so that it is cemented in our minds what is happening there. So verses 17 to 19, And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Cain. I know we, last week, we, we, don't, we don't know why that just dropped in like that. But last week, just by reading a scripture by itself, it just makes this point that Ham is the father of Cain. And clearly telling us something. But we dealt with that last week. And remember, as we go further, we will get back to that to answer some questions that naturally arise from the presentation that was made. So don't worry, we, we, we're going to get back to that. But it's just that we're continuing um, in the interest of time, and we will come back now and address some matters in relation to that and other things that we will, would have been teaching on. 
All right, verse 19. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. So again, brothers and sisters, this is a scripture that we must not forget. So let us look again and, and take it from the top. We see Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman, Bible. And the scriptures show that that is so. And the Bible says, brothers and sisters, it is fact. Then we see that Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. So we, we are establishing now that it is not just three sons that Adam had and Eve had. Because there are folks, notice, and it's one of the questions that was, is asked and I made mention a while ago. If it was only Cain and Abel and Cain killed Abel and then Seth came. So it was only now Cain and Seth. Where did Cain get his wife? I want us to notice it was not only three persons that were on the face of the earth. Notice, according to Genesis chapter 5, verse 3 and verse 4, uh, sons and daughters. And of course, if you have sons and daughters, they will continue to repopulate and multiply. So after a period of time, while Cain and Seth is here, there would have been other sons and daughters and other children coming and coming and coming. Of course, that now says something more. Is it that it is saying that these brothers and sisters intermarried and had children? We will get to that. But just to make the point, so follow the sequence. And so we, we leave from that now when we jump over to Noah and his family. And what we are seeing in the perspective being presented is that Noah and his family became the nucleus of every nation that was to be spread across the face of the earth. Because the Bible said that Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. No mention is made here of their wives, but you know the wives had to be there. And it is how the Bible presents things, the male being the dominant figure and playing the dominant role. Sometimes we get the feeling that ladies are not there. They are. Uh, it's, it's, it's how the thing is presented. And so what the scripture is saying now is that these three boys became the nucleus, the area from which all the nations were spread abroad across the earth because verse 17 said it. And God said unto Noah, this is the token of the of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the face of the earth and the sons of Noah that went forth from the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah and of them was the whole earth overspread. And so they started to expand. They started to spread out until we reach another a crossroad, another section where the people were all gathered together around a particular point, which is at the Tower of Babel. Now, there's something very interesting in Genesis chapter 11, verses 8 and 9. Genesis chapter 11, verses 8 and 9. It tells us, <coughs> it tells us pretty much, so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth and they left off to build the city so that they were gathered together all of those that came from those three sons Shem, Ham and Japheth and they continued to keep themselves together and they coalesced around the Tower of Babel, all the descendants of these three boys, you know, and they were right around the Tower of Babel, and they were continuing, and they were building, and they were under the leadership of a particular person, 
and they continued and they continued. And in verse 9 says, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. So we are seeing something here that gives an indication that clearly all humankind were together in one location at a particular point in history, in our human history. And we need to remember that. But then something happened and God scattered them right across. And as a result of that scattering, they went abroad upon the face of the earth. So some went over there and what we now call Africa. Some went over there what we now call Asia. Some went over there, what we call Europe. Some went over there, what we call North America, etc., etc. And it goes on to expand. And these are the generations of Shem. Shem was an hundred years old and begat Arphaxed two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begat Arphaxed five hundred years and he begat sons and daughters. Many times when you hear it says, he lived an hundred years and begat Arphaxed. Arphaxed was the main person that was being presented here because through the line of Arphaxed, some things were, but it doesn't mean that he didn't have children before. He had Arphaxed when he was a hundred and after Arphaxed, he lived a much hundred years more and during that time, he had many, many more children. But he could easily have had other children even before Arphaxed because he was, as it says here, he was a um, hundred when he had him, Arphaxed. So understand what I'm saying. He could have easily had much more children before and afterwards he also had much more children. And so it's very important that we understand that. So what is happening, you know, the Tower of Babel, everybody was together and something happened and they spread across the face of the earth. But then it's very interesting that Acts, the, in, in chapter 17 and verse 26, gives us a picture of the whole thing. Acts chapter 17 and verse 26, it gives us a picture of the whole thing. And here the writer, Luke, is saying something to us. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Brothers and sisters, this is Bible. Brothers and sisters, this is word. This is the word of God. So here the writer in the New Testament scripture, again, this is Luke writing, he's the author of the book of Acts, and he is describing the spread abroad, all nations of the earth and everything. And notice the term that he used, and hath made of one blood, and this is God, no, one blood. And when he says one blood, you know, it means we are coming from one common ancestry. We are coming from one blood. When somebody tells you that you and that person who is your brother, you are one blood, it means this is your brother, same mother, same father. We are one blood. The, the term blood is thicker than water. It means that when you are that close relative, same mother, same father, that blood thicker than anything else. And when the writer is here writing that we are made of one blood, he's basically saying we are coming from a common ancestry. So let's read the scripture. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bones of their habitation so that he determined that they were to be spread abroad, although they came from one common location, one common ancestry. It was determined that they were to be spread across and become nations that dwell across all the face of the earth. So that there's something that God is doing or was doing. And at the end of what he was doing, he indicated and showed and made it clear that from Adam and Eve, then to Noah and his sons, then through the sons of Noah, the three boys, 
a set of people came and as they started to spread and to spread and to multiply, when I say spread, I'm talking, I should say multiply, as they started to multiply and to multiply, the numbers grew and they gathered themselves together at one place and was like a township, a city. They should have been spreading out because, you know, the more people are coming onto the face of the earth and the generations start to expand. It is normal that people spread themselves out, but they were now gathered together for a nefarious cause. That was to build a tower to defy God. God scattered them. And so the writer is saying that from one blood, Adam and Eve, coming on through Noah and his sons, coming down all the way at the Tower of Babel, still one blood, until the scattering. Now guess who scattered? The one blood, the family that came from one blood. They scattered. And they ran across and spread across the earth, left, right, and center. So that the point that I want to make to us, brothers and sisters, is that all who we see spread across the face of the earth right now, it, they actually came, based on Acts 17 and verse 26, one common ancestor. We are one blood. And it was the act of God there at the Tower of Babel that caused the spreading out all across the globe. So that it doesn't matter where on the earth people are. It is like this because of what God did at the Tower of Babel. And men were spread across the face of the earth. And that's a very important point to, come, to, 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 to make. And a very important point to remember. We are going to come back to that. Because I can understand. I can hear you saying no. I can understand if it was just one family and they start to spread across the earth good but wouldn't they all look alike because it's one family it's one race we're coming from adam and eve and adam had as i said before would have had certain traits so everybody from adam is supposed to have a trait similar to either adam or eve uh, and you're partially right but we will expand on that as we go so we're not jumping the gun but we want to establish the points bit by bit. So from Adam and Eve, you had Cain, then you had Seth. And each of them had their children coming down. But then those, that group was wiped out. And it started over with Noah and then his three boys, which is Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And they now started to repopulate the earth again. But as they repopulated and they grew in numbers, they coalesced in a city, township-like, uh, Babel. That was where Babylon eventually came from. And they started to defy God and to build a tower. In other words, they were doing something that was totally against what God had instructed. And they would have known God's instruction. And God came down and again, judgment was passed. And they were, they, they were spread abroad, spread across the earth. Their languages were confounded and confused and those that understood this particular language they all gathered together and those that understood together another language they all gathered together and that would have been a very very normal thing and that is exactly what Happen. So those that understood what was being said, because here you had some speaking Spanish, and those that spoke Spanish could understand, so the Spanish-speaking ones joined themselves together. And then those that spoke French, they didn't understand one thing about Spanish, so the French-speaking ones, they understand that other one was talking French, and they gathered themselves together. And it went like that over and over. And I'm just using Spanish and French as examples, because that might not have been the language that they spoke at that time. I'm just saying that those groups that understand in their particular group language join themselves together. And all who understand, so the confusion of language or the confounding of language is that everybody started to speak different things. So those that understood form a little clique, form a group here, and they went in a particular direction. Another set who understand each other 
form of their group and they went their particular way and so they dispersed they, they, they dispersed right across the earth and those in their groups could understand each other form their little tribal group and went their particular way but there is more to their joining up, joining up than just the common language and we will get to that later on all right we will get to that later on and we will see you now that a certain language group and they went there another language group and they went there but there there were other traits that were no doubt similar to those and as they went you know they started to repopulate their little sections also and so they, those little tribes now because children become tribes and tribes become nations and that is how the thing spread itself across but ultimately when we come back to the beginning of it they all can be traced right back to one blood, one common ancestor. And the Bible makes it absolutely clear. And we have looked at the scriptures. Make no mistake about it. That is how it is. Now, the question is, and we go back to the slide, because I want us to look at the slide. The question is, and we're going to go right into it. If we are... You know, yes, there are different people, there are groups, there are cultures, different cultures, but it is really one race. Now, I want us to understand that Jesus himself, because it is important when we are making these points and establishing these positions, many times we see where there is corroboration by none other than the Lord Jesus himself. So in the book of St. Matthew, chapter 19 and verse 4, you remember that scripture where Jesus was asked about marriage? Yes. And his answer, the answer that he gave was very, very pointed. And it easily corroborates, it easily shows, it easily indicates to us that Jesus was making the point himself that we looked at in scriptures in other scriptures just a short while ago and he answered because you know they were not asking him about marriages but look at his answer and easily he's validating the statements in scriptures you know that at the beginning it was only adam and eve that god had made look at what he said and he answered and said unto them have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. This, brothers and sisters, is Jesus talking. This is Jesus now stepping in. He's answering a question that they ask him, you know. But even in answering it, he's making a fundamental point that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female he's talking about adam and eve and he's saying that it is god that made adam and eve at the beginning this is coming from jesus brothers and sisters there is only one biological race and that is adam's race or the human race we have one common parents and I want us to understand that. That is very, very, very important. I want us to understand that. This is the part where a lot of folks say that, you know, the, the, this is where the, the skeptics and those that don't believe say something is just absolute. We cannot come from one common ancestry. And Jesus himself in Matthew 19 is validating that what the scripture, what the Bible say, and what's happening at the beginning so when jesus spoke about didn't you didn't you not read that in the beginning he made male and what he was talking about when he said in the beginning he was saying that what you read in genesis is correct so brothers and sisters if we believe in jesus and believe who jesus is understand that jesus is validating right here the book of genesis because Genesis is the book that told us about beginning and God made man and God made woman and Jesus is now here saying, yes, it is so. Have you not read it? So brothers and sisters, do not be sidetracked. This 
is fact. And I want us to understand that. So it's not two races. So you don't have a white race. You don't have a black race. You don't have an Indian race. You don't have a race called Chinese. No. They might be, as I said, cultural groups, different people, but it's really one race because we all came from one blood. Adam. One blood. And that is Bible. And so we're going to take the confusion out of the thing so that we understand that it broke down and it spread out and it went across, but we all came from Adam. Don't worry, we're going to go back, you know, because if we came from Adam, how some people look so and others look so, don't worry, man, we're going to get to that. But just follow the steps as we go down because that is so important. And so the big question now is where did Cain get his wife? And, you know, we, we, we have mentioned that over and over. And, yes, we want to just jump at it because it is in so many people's minds. And so, notice again, I did tell you we're going to come back to Genesis chapter 5 and verse 4. And it says, And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, was 800 years, and he begot sons and daughters. So the point that I want to make is this now, brethren. There were women around, certainly. Because many didn't believe or know that other sons were born to Adam and Eve. Many didn't know that many daughters were born to them because the Bible said it, that they had sons and them of 800 years. My God. No, you know, I was looking at a presentation just two nights ago. My wife was showing me a feature with Bob Marley. They were asking how many children he had. And there was another individual, um, I forget his name. He was a music producer. There was a feature on him also, and I, I think Bob Marley had his children in the teens. I don't remember how much. It might have been 14, 15, and, but that is small compared to um, this music producer. Uh, his name eluded me, but he had like 37 children. Uh, this is one man, you know, and he died relatively young. He was something like in his 60s. Are just turned 70 and he had 30 had children but then no problem with that there is one king in Israel that he had 70 sons they didn't count the daughters but he had 70 sons and he died at the regular old age like the rest of like probably 80 80 something so a little man 80 years of age have 80 sons him don't count the daughters so let us say you have 80 sons, give and take. Are you generally, you know, you know, you have a lot of girls, but say you have 20 daughters. You're talking 100 children. 100 children. And this is a man whose lifespan was just 80 years. Just imagine Adam. After he begot set, you know, he lived 800 years. After he begot set, he lived 800 years. No, I can tell you, saints of God, I can tell you that especially at that time when the whole earth was open, the, you know, generations just coming together and a man of 800 years in front of him, you know, I know, I know, some of us would have wished we lived in those times because you're talking about 800 years, you know. And Adam, I am sure, was not just there counting cows. But the Bible said he had sons and daughters. And I am sure it is many. And look here. He had Seth when he was 130 years of age, according to verse 3. Same Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3. We looked at it earlier, so I told you to remember that scripture. So you can just look back at your little note if you took it, or afterwards you look back at the slide. So at 130, he had Seth. But it doesn't mean that after he had Cain and Abel and years before that, 
that he sat down until he reached 130 and then he had set. Set is mentioned because it is at that time that men began again to call on the name of the Lord and the history was going to continue through Seth. So many times when we see the spotlight, it's just like it always make mention of Noah's three sons and no mention is made of the daughters and yet children couldn't come unless the daughters were there because you have to have a woman. But the fact that the focus is on the offspring and men are seen as the head of the household, the Bible focuses on the men, but the women are there. The fact that they want to make the point that it is when Seth was born that men again began through that offspring to call on the name of the Lord. That is really the point that was being made. So the focus is on Seth. And so he said when he was 130, he begot Seth. But it doesn't mean that prior to Seth that other sons and daughters were not born. And then after he had Seth, of course, he considered to have sons and daughters. It is the norm. Now, we have made the point that Adam and Eve did not just have three boys. Cain, Abel who was killed, and then Seth. No. A lot of people thought that. But verse 4 of chapter 5 tells us that he had sons and daughters. And his lifespan was 900 and odd years. Now, given that, that is almost a millennium. You know how many children, if he was a healthy man, and I am sure he was, and if he was a healthy woman, and I am sure she was, do you know how many children they could have had for 900 years? I mean, when a, when a Judas king, as I said, is 80 odd years him live, and him had 170 sons that we know, not counting daughters, in 70 years. So let us say you expand his 70 years by 10 and his 700 years. Him still don't reach Adam. But let us say you expand it by 10 and you go to 700 years. If in 70 he did say 100, expand that by 10, you're talking 1,000. And remember, you know, as those men, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, they are still strong, they are going, and they are going, and they are going. It is when they reach up into, well, the fact that they live so long, just, just extrapolate in your mind, they could easily have hundreds of children, one man. And then that child, those children that they have, as they started to have children among themselves, because that is exactly what happened. And so we are coming to the point now that I want to make to us. Sons and daughters were born to Adam. So there were men and there were women. Two things are in scriptures that is used by these skeptics to say that Genesis is wrong. They say, one, Cain could not have a wife because there was only three boys, no ladies. But we throw that out because Genesis 5 and verse 4 tells us that Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. So women were around. What naturally arises from that is the question, hold on, hold on. So does that mean that brothers married to their sisters and had children? The answer to that is yes. That was permissible and that is exactly what happened. Now you might hold your head and say, but something wrong with that, something wrong with that. No. Many of us are, even now, are unaware that as far down as Abraham's time, people were marrying their relatives. Most folks don't even know that Abraham's wife, Sarah, was his sister. You might be shocked to hear that. They had different mothers, yes, but they had the same father. And in fact, let me bring up the screen. 
because I just want to run through something with us. I want us to understand that it was permissible, it was actually what God allowed, and it was only at a particular time in history that God changed that action, that God changed that relationship issue and prohibited it. But prior to that law in Leviticus, and we're going to look at it shortly, prior to that, it is what happened. Nobody had a problem. None of us. Abraham is the father of the faithful. Abraham is who we use as our benchmark when it comes to faith. Abraham was the friend of God. And he married to his sister. And it was quite normal. In fact, you remember when Isaac was to get married, they sent down to his mother's house or his relative's house to get somebody from his mother. In, in other words, his family was coming together. It was a practice that was continuing right down. Nothing was wrong with it. It was not abhorred by Almighty God. It was allowed by God because that is the only way that you could have had reproduction taking place because if Adam and Eve, God made Adam and Eve, God made Eve for Adam, so they were not brother and sister, they were just made, but then their offspring came and they got together and had children and that was normal. God allowed that. that so this was God's plan. And it is when sin came, and I don't want to jump the gun because I want us to look at the slide. It was when sin came that the whole dynamic started to change. It continued for a while. But then notice that in Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 9, God actually tells us that in Leviticus 18 and verse 9, God actually tells us that the thing has to be changed. So that is very, very, very important, at least to know. But just to, just to get back to the slide, I want us to <coughs> recognize, yes, it was permissible to be married to one's relative. And therein lies the answer that we have been looking for. Therein lies the answer to the question, can we marry our relatives? Today, we don't marry close relatives, you know, and we, we will explain why, because we see from the books, and here is the scripture, we see that while God had allowed it, and God established it that way, later on, he brought in laws against close intermarriage, and that was way down at the time of Moses, all the way before that, it was no issue. So we see here, you know, in, and this, this is the scripture I made mention of earlier on, the nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncovered. Remember, we spoke about what the term nakedness of father or nakedness of mother meant. We did that last week. And so what... The writer, what Moses is saying here in Leviticus 18 and verse 9 is that as at this time, seeds coming into law, this is not permissible. This must not happen. So it has changed now. But if you notice prior to that, Moses, uh, sorry, not Moses, Abraham, it was his very sister that he married. And it was normal, no issue, nobody make any issue at all. And others, it was the norm. And so that was what was allowed, that was what was permissible. So that, so that Cain would have had women around, contrary to what many thought that there were no women around, Adam and Eve had sons and daughters, and those daughters were around. They were having children, and over the space of 100 years, say 200 years, you know how many more women would have been born and they would have spread out. So folks would now start finding other ladies that wasn't even as close to them because they were now sp being spread and spread and spread. So that is exactly what happened and that is exactly where that woman for Cain would have come from. It is right there in the Bible. Now, the scripture that we, uh, in Genesis 20 verse 12, is the scripture, 
And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. No issue. No problem. It was his wife. And it was permissible. And there was no problem at all with it. So, point is, brothers and sisters, they were allowed when Adam and Eve at creation uh, was established as husband and wife, they were perfect. It was sin that set in. And as a result of sin, you know, mutations start to take place, you know, errors step in. And over time, these errors, these mutations would have increased. And therefore, at some point, as these errors that would come into the offspring start to increase, the more you're nearer, the more you're closer in terms of relation, the nearer you are. It is when you, if you get together, then these mutations, these errors, these mistakes that are in the system, in the genes, in the DNA, once you're very close now, they are, those errors are going to be so similar because they are close kin. And as far, the further you go away now from Adam and Eve, the further you go away now from Cain and Seth and their descendants, the, 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 the errors, the mutations, which means error and mistakes in the, the DNA gets worse and worse. And so the closer you are as family members is the nearer those mutations or errors will be. So that if as, as you go further away, the closer you are as brother and sister, it is the more problems you're going to have with your offspring. And I believe that is why God forbid it at that time. Because by that time, a long patch, a long distance had come now. The time had elapsed for quite a while between, Abra between Adam and Eve and then Cain and Seth and then Noah ultimately and his sons. As it started to came, come down the line, they are getting further and further away from the original state when the DNA was perfect. And as farther away as you come from that state of perfection, it is the more the mutations, the error will manifest itself. So the closer you are, is the more similar your mutation, your error will be. It means, what that simply means, is that if a brother and a sister have children, because your mutations are now so, because remember the error is terrible now, you know, the further away you are, is the more the errors are manifesting and getting worse and worse. So you take a brother and a sister, and their errors are close. If they get together and have children, all of a sudden we start to find and will find that those children have defects. Them can't walk, them foot, them born without foot, and a whole lot of things start to happen because the close relatives have their mutations, their errors are so close that you have similar mutations, and then they start to have offsprings that are defective or have many defects and abnormalities. And this is now, I believe, why God steps in and are stepped in in Leviticus and prohibited it and now say look here if you're gonna get married go further out because by now the population would have expanded there would have been much more people it would have now been easy or much easier to get a wife or a husband separate and apart from those who are your next of kin in terms of brother and sister at the start it was not able to be done because there was nobody else and God allowed it. God permitted it so there was not any sense of guilt. There was not a law that you were doing anything wrong. God did not step in and say not to do that or to do that. And so it was quite natural, quite normal. It was acceptable. Abraham, the father of the faithful, who was a friend of God, married his own half-sister. And it was no issue at all. But when God now in Leviticus chapter 18 came in with that particular and said nope no longer cut that out now all of a sudden it became in the consciousness of all of us and that's why today if we just think about a brother and a sister your brother and sister with the same mother and father your brother and sister 
with the same father but different mother. You, from you think about you being brother and sister and think about getting together, it turns you off. Because in our mindset, it is just wrong because it has been established from there in Leviticus. It has come across not only from the Jewish people, but it has come across into... And you know, many of the folks that have accepted the Bible principally as a book of morals, they hold to that. But you know that there are still today even nations where brothers and sisters still get married and still, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Many tribes even in continental Africa still continue with that. But this is something that is outlawed. In fact, even governments now get involved to try to outlaw it because it was something that was practiced throughout the ages and today they are trying to outlaw it because what they're finding is that the offspring of this kind of coming together they are all um, defective and it is a problem and God knows why he would have stopped it from then so this is exactly what would have happened so Cain got his wife from amongst the daughters that were born to Adam and Eve it was permissible, it was acceptable, and there was no issue with it in the same way that Abraham had his sister for his wife. So this, brothers and sisters, is where Cain would have gotten his wife. And so that is pretty much, pretty much the answer to that. And you know, many folks would have said, boy, this one hard to swallow. Oh, God. But look, it's just how it is. This is how God allowed it. This is how it happened. And at the time, there was no problem at all with it. God allowed it at the time. In fact, I want to, I want to raise another point just to cause us to understand that these are things that are God's prerogative. And he does it. Because he is sovereign, he puts things in place, and it is his prerogative. So he started it that way, and then he put in a law to say no more. That is God. So not even if there was another Abraham to come, he could marry his sister because he said no more. No more close of kin. So he stopped. So he allowed it, and then he stopped it. You might ask the question, why would God do that? I mean, is, is, is it that God is inconsistent? No, he's not inconsistent, but he's God. Did you know that it was always God's intention for one man and one woman to be together? It was never God's intention for one man to have all five wives and ten concubines. It was always for one man and one woman, and there was something about that relationship. And even Jesus spoke about it when he was talking about marriage and said, look here, that is how God did it. And for this cause, the man leave mother and father and will find his wife and the two shall become one. And that was God's intent. And then later on in the New Testament times, it speaks to that definitively and prohibits us from having more than one wife. Every man must have his wife one wife and if you are in the church one wife and if you're going to be a leader one wife yet that was his intention from the very beginning in genesis however brothers and sisters we see that god did allow people even people that were his choice to have more than one wives David, who was a man after God's own heart, he had a couple of wives as well. And not only that, in addition to those wives, he had some concubines. There was ten of them that he left at the house. You remember last week we went through that. And he ran from Absalom. And those ten girls on the side side chicks he left them to and absalom went in to do a stand but the fact is he had wives i think he had about eight of them and he had many 
girlfriends. And guess what? God allowed it. God never have no God never reprimanded him about him having wives and concubines. Why? What am I saying? There are some things that God allow because it's just his prerogative. And when he decides that it is time for us to stop, then he stops some things the Bible says. God winked at. In other words, he allowed it. He had a reason. He allowed it. It's his prerogative. He is God. And then he says, time to stop. So you and I are in the age, in the day, in the period, in the time when God said, stop. So if you use David to say he's your role model, and God will understand, brother, you are a sinner. You ain't going to make it. Because the Bible today, the word today, God put up the stop sign and said no more. And it is his prerogative. Yes? So it is the same way. He allowed for brothers and sisters, for close relatives to get married, to have offspring. The, the DNA, everything was so close to perfection. It was perfect initially with Adam and Eve. After the sin, you know, over time things degenerate. But at the earlier pass, in order to cause the population to expand, God allowed it. But then the time came and he said, stop. And we have to understand that God is God and he has that prerogative. And he did that with close relatives being married. He did that with one man having more than one wife. In fact, when he was establishing David, he said, look here, I have given to you the wives of Saul. In 2 Samuel. So God did that. It was his intention for one man to have one woman. And it will ultimately happen. But whatever the circumstances were that caused God to allow it, he allowed it and he winked at it. But then he has established in his word again what it is that he wants. So we must accept that, brothers and sisters. And that is exactly how it is. So let's get back to the slide. And as we continue to go on. So that was a big issue. That was a big issue. And that was actually sorted out. Now there's another thing that they use to try to say that we cannot really rely on and accept the word of God. Because not only is it that there were no women around for Cain to marry. And so the Bible couldn't be right. We have just cleared that up. But they also said... Cain was frightened when he saw people around and, and we're on earth. So there is also the question which the answer that we gave just now would have addressed that. Because they say, where could he have gotten his wife? And then they say, look at it now. There was no women around. And yet he went to nod. And found himself a wife because the Bible says he knew his wife in Nod. Now, I want us to be very clear on this and I want us to understand what is happening. The Bible in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 16, verses 16 and 17, we are going to read shortly. But folks have said it over and over. One, the Bible is wrong because... There was no women around. It was only Cain, Abel, and Seth. We have just explained that. No problem. But then they say it is, it is wrong on another point. Because if there's no women around, how did he go to Nod and meet up on a woman? And Nod was a much further place than where he was actually resi residing. But the truth is, did the Bible actually say that he found his wife at Nod? The answer is no. And you see, when we are going through scriptures, it is important that we take the time out, you know, brothers and sisters, and look closely at the scriptures. And so I want us to read Genesis chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. And it says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. So he went 
and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden, on the east of Eden. And then it went on now to say, and Cain knew his wife. So that what a lot of the folks are saying now, he found his wife, because he said knew her, he found his wife when he went to Nod. But that's not what the Bible is saying. What it actually is saying here, that wherever he was, he left, and without, without a doubt, he would have left with his wife. They left, so he left and went to Nod. And at Nod, he knew her. Now, knew, this word knew, doesn't mean that he got to know her when he reached there. Because you remember last week we were discussing it and we were saying, brothers and sisters, it is very important that we understand idioms, the idiomatic terms, the terms that are used in different parts, in different countries, in different sections of different countries, in different communities in the country. Because if you don't know, you will easily mistake what is an idiomatic term and then take it literal and believe that you have the scripture right when we have it wrong. Cain knew his wife. Notice what comes after it. And she conceived. So what is it that happens to cause somebody to conceive? They get together sexually. So what this verse is actually saying, brothers and sisters, is that Cain had intercourse with his wife at Nod. So without doubt, then, he would have left where he was because he said he left the presence of the Lord and dwelt with Nod. He would have carried his wife there. And while there at Nod, they had intercourse and she conceived at Nod. So he didn't get to know her. He didn't find her at Nod and get to know her. The word new there simply means they had intercourse. So at Nod, she conceived and bear Enoch, etc., etc. And this is pretty much what it is saying. So it did not say that he went to Nod and found a wife. It was at Nod that he knew his wife, which means he, they had relations and a child came. And that is what the scripture is saying. And I want to, because based on what we said last week, you remember last week we used another term that spoke to having intercourse. And it is the same term that says, new one nakedness or uncover one's nakedness it is a term that means they had physical activity sexual activity and if you don't understand that idiomatic term you might leave thinking that they took off the person clothes and look at them and that is not it at all and so when we said earlier on that God forbade brothers and sisters to have sexual intercourse, he stopped it in Leviticus chapter 18 verse 9, where he said that brother must not uncover his sister's nakedness, uh, or sister or the brother. No, it simply means that brothers and sisters must not have sexual activity. And he put down that law right there and stop that practice, even though it was happening before. So we have to understand the terms, brothers and sisters, otherwise we are going to have a problem. In fact, I decided to just give us an illustration of what an idiom is so that we are clear on it because we did it last week and you know, a couple of folks had called and said they didn't even recognize that that could be so. It's the first they're really looking at it and then looking at the scriptures together, they start to piece it together and to see that in fact it was so. And so they wanted me to just expound a little bit more and when you say idiom, what do you mean? And so I'm going to do it from an English perspective so that we can understand. Otherwise, um, we can easily be misled to be led astray easily and lose the essence of what is being said. Now, an idiom is a phrase or an expression that presents a figurative meaning, something that is not real. So it uses something figurative, you know, and attach it to a phrase to kind of bring over a certain kind of understanding. So, you know, your mind, and we're going to show it shortly to explain what I just meant by that. So look at it again. An idiom is a phrase or an expression. Sometimes it's just one word, you know, and it presents figurative and non-real, non-literal meaning 
to a particular thing. And this language is peculiar to a particular people or to a particular community, you know, in a country. You can be in a country, you know, but if you're dealing with people out in Westmoreland, for example, when they talk certain things, it, they have certain meanings to so some terminologies that if you come from Kingston, you don't even realize that this is what they are talking. And I'm just using a, a local um, arrangement to, to bring the point across. So essentially, you use a phrase or an expression, a word, to kind of bring across a particular meaning. And this is, this is done throughout countries of the world. Different countries have different idioms that mean different things. And if you are going to understand something that is happening over in Israel, these people write Hebrews. So if they write it in Hebrews, you know they are Hebrew people, Jewish people, and you need to understand their custom and their culture and the community in which it is spoken so that you are clear on what it is that they are saying. Otherwise, we could leave with a mistaken notion of what they were trying to say. I think last week when we spoke, you know, we used the term the right hand of God. In our regular literal English, right hand means right hand. If Jesus is standing on the right hand of God, it means God sit down and I'm standing and Jesus stand up on him right side. And yet in the Jewish term, the idiom right hand of God means a place of power and might and authority. So that when Stephen said, I saw Jesus, I saw God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. What Stephen was saying, I saw Jesus in the place standing as God with power and might. And the people tear off them clothes and stole him to death because he was so blasphemous to say that in putting Jesus in the place of God. They understood what Steve meant. We reading it and don't understand that idiomatic term will get the feeling that there was a literal man standing and Jesus physically standing beside him, his right hand. And so yes, that is what we will get of it if we don't understand the idiomatic term, the right hand of God. So we have got to go back to the Jews and back to the Hebrews, see what that term means to them and then understand it in our English context. Otherwise, we're going to take it wrong and leave with the wrong impression. So that is when I make mention that idiom is a phrase or expression. This is what I mean. You have to understand what it is saying in the context of the writers and the context of the custom of that country, that people, that community. And then know when you understand that you can properly interpret it in your local lingo. And that is very important. Now, as an example, as an example, I want us to, to <coughs> look at some I want us to look at some basic English terms. I'm trying to find the right slide for us, so just a moment, because I just wanted to look at some English terms so that we can understand even clearer what is meant when we talk about idiomatic terms and using the English. All right, so we won't put it on the slide, but let's, let me just run through it with you. So when we say... As an example, in English, an English idiom or expression, I want us to... And you ever heard the term, it's a piece of cake? So you just do an exam and, and you come out of the exam and someone asks you, how was the exam? We would then say, oh, it was a piece of cake. Brothers and sisters, that is an idiomatic term. It's an idiom, it's a term. And that term really means... It, it was easy. So it's not that it was saying, if, if you don't understand our English terminology, our English idiomatic expression, it's a piece of cake. If you are from somewhere else and you see that, you are going to start to think cake? Or ask him, oh, the exam was, it looked like they had a cake-eating test. And that is certainly not what was the case. So that... It's a piece of cake in answer to a question, how was the exam? All it is saying is that it was easy. 
I wonder if you understand what I'm saying. Also, if you are in, we are having Bible study here in Kingston, and I might hear that it is tearing over in Portmore, rain, and we ask, make a quick call to somebody and ask, boy, I hear rain falling over there. How is it? And the person responds, my God, it is raining cats and dogs. If you don't understand that idiomatic term or idiomatic term, brothers and sisters, you might be looking outside or telling them to look outside and say, oh, can that be cats and dogs? But my God, and you start to get uptight. But all that, that term, that phrase, that expression mean is that it is raining real hard. You understand? Or there's another one, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. What it really, and, and we know what it means. It means you're going to get two things done with one single action. So these are terms, are you let the cat out of the bag? Because we all know these Jamaican idiomatic expressions. Let the puss out of the bag. All it means is that you, you, you give away a secret. So these are what I call idiomatic expressions, brothers and sisters, idiomatic phrases. And so when it says Cain knew his wife, it simply means it's an idiomatic term that simply means they came together. They came together. Cain came together with his wife and notice this following part of the scripture said, she conceived and bore Enoch. So it is important that we understand that. It is important that we, it is important that we get that and that we can move ahead. So we're going we're gonna to move ahead. We're going to move ahead now. Having said that and having gotten that clear, we can move ahead. But I trust that we are clear on that when we see those idiomatic terms, if we don't take the time out to look back and, and drill into the thing, then we will certainly leave with the wrong impression and we would then have a big problem. All right? So having said all of this now, we want to, we want to come to a critical point, a critical juncture uh, to see where where did the differences that we have today come from so we have said a mouthful we have said quite a bit where did the differences come from um and when i say differences what am i talking about i'm talking about um this the shade of our skin i'm talking about the color of our hair i'm talking about the texture of our hair. There are so many things with the color of our eyes, yes, and so many things that we know that separate people, one set of people from another, yes. Where did this all come from? How do we explain that if it is not evolution? How could it be? You're saying, Brother Daly, it is Adam and Eve, they are the common ancestors. How could then we have? People with long hair and some with short hair, some with white skin and some with black skin, some in between, how it happened. Now to understand this, we will have to do a, a little journey, a small trip um, through some basic genetics, right? We're going to take time and we're going to go through and so forth. And we are going to get to that. Yes, we are going to do some basic genetics. We are going to look at X chromosome and Y chromosomes are just a simple, simple genetics so that we can just develop a basic understanding and to see how things come about. But just before we get into that, I want us to notice because <clears throat> this is where it all came from. Remember that everyone was to go into the ark. We notice at different times, we see when God in creation in Genesis chapter 1, he made things after their kind. And this was mentioned about 10 times. We see the same thing coming and happening again in Genesis 6, where they find the word, you know, after their kind, two of each kind, to go, that is to go into the ark. And 
it kind of, after a while, we realize that something is wrong because if God is going to destroy everything and if God is going to wipe out the humankind and the animal kind that was there, amen, before the flood and then all that was left would have gone in the flood and then came out as one family, then if God did that, we are then starting over again with Shem, Ham, and Japheth alone. And so, if that is the case, how is it that after the flood, when the animals came out, when the three sons came out with their wives, when Noah and his wife came, how is it that we have the kind of variety, we have the kind of variation that we have? How is it? And like I say, we are going to go into that. But just to, just to make a point, and you know, we, I realize that we probably are already um, coming up to our time to stop, but I want to still make the point because it has come to the fore over and over to show and to discredit again the book of Genesis and to indicate that it cannot be real and it cannot be right because here it is that we are saying that God was telling Noah to get two of every kind of animal and etc etc and the, the skeptics say that that is impossible because there are so many species around the, there are millions of species and they could not reasonably hold in the ark. But God did not use the word species to describe what Noah was to take in the ark. He was to take two of every kind. Now, you have about 338 breeds of dog. Right? 338 breed of dog. And it is important that we understand that. It, I mean, folks have done their checks and done their research. And just in the dog family, the dog kind, there are 338, they say. In the cat family or the cat kind, there are a couple of hundreds in the bird species they say there are thousands in fact when you look at them all together there are millions of species so if you are going to take two of every species it is going to be too much and the size of the ark could not hold the millions that will be there but god's word did not say two of every species that was not his intent is worth a two of every kind. And when we use the word kind, uh, we find that the Hebrew word for kind, certainly for what is there in Genesis chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, it, it's a Hebrew word that speaks to a classification, and it's the classification that we would call family. Right? So God is saying that it is two of every family of animals. Now, although you might have thousands of species, species in a particular thousands of species in a particular group it might just be one kind remember we say the breeds of dog or the species of dog there are so many in terms of species so many in terms of breeds but then the dog family is just one kind and so god said two so they could have taken just two. So from the dog kind, it is just two dogs. So forget about species and breeds and all that. God said two of every kind. From the cat kind, even though you might have hundreds of species, God said two kinds. So the kind, which is the family, is just cat. So he said two cat, two dog, and he went across. So that when they know, added it up. When they now added it up, it adds up to about, in terms of total kind, there was about 
practically approximately 1,400 different animal kinds. So putting the birds together, the bigger animals, the smaller animals, all of them together in terms of kinds, they found that there is about just approximately 1,400 kinds and that captures, captured all within the animal and bird kingdom going around and around. So it's not millions of kinds. It is just about 1,400 and that is calculating it on the high side. It is believed to be less than a thousand different kinds in terms of family of animals. Because a whole lot of what we call, it, it, it is said that the bat can be actually one kind, one family. And you have so many species of bat, thousands, and yet it is one family. So when you look at all the different family of animals and so forth, no matter how they look, you know, no matter how they inbreed and they have different species coming down, it is one kind that God said. So the cat family, the dog family, the bat family, and others, when we add them up in total, you're talking about 1,400 animal kinds. And God said two of each kind. So that you're talking a few thousand animals. And most land animals, brothers and sisters, are not big. And for the big ones, I, God wouldn't tell him to bring the biggest elephant. Or the biggest dinosaur. Or the biggest of the big animals. No. No they would no doubt would have taken smaller ones. And God is the one that would have led those animals there also. So that the size of the ark, based on the dimensions that we were given, could easily, brothers and sisters, hold a couple thousand of animals comfortably. And so more than enough room was in the ark based on the size of that Ark. And so I will have to certainly stop it here for this evening, brothers and sisters. So when we hit it again now, we are going to go right into um, the different groupings of people. Where did the skin color come from? We are going to go into the different groupings of people. Where did the hair texture come from? Why were some eyes blue and some green? and some black and some brown. Uh, why are some people so tall and another said so short? And we're going to look at the spectrum of the color from one extreme to the other and in between. And we are going to find that God in his wisdom and in his diversity would have done some things to have allowed this to happen and it become a part of those who are being spread across the entire length and breadth of the earth. It is not rocket science. It is not evolution. It is not out of this world. It is right there. And a, a basic appreciation of genetics. And when I say basic, the, 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 the foundations, the fundamentals are there. The foundations are there. But these things will cause us to understand now how when a man and a woman comes together, the combination of genes, what it can do, how it can impact the size of the child as they grow. It can, the combination can impact the color of the skin. The combination can impact a lot of things. And we are going to look at it. And we are going to see just from the genetic information that God has placed inside of us in all the things that he has placed, the information that he has placed in our genes, we are going to see a lot of things exploding in our eyes and we will appreciate and understand that we are coming from one common ancestry and we don't have to evolve and those that evolved in Africa, they were dark. And those that evolved in North America and Europe, they were white. And those that evolved in the Mid and Far East, they were in between. And they no, we are going to see that based on what God programmed into our genes, a whole lot of things can happen. And we are going to show you scientific facts, scientific proof, and basic genetics. And we will see some things 
opening up in front of our very eyes and we will celebrate the dynamics of the God that we serve and the diversity of the God that we serve and we'll see that he's the same God, the same mother and father and nothing is out of the realm of human birth and experience and it is right there to substantiate that everything in the book of Genesis is absolutely correct and God is alive and is the author and has inspired the writers to put the things there and there is no evolution and man did not come from apes or anything like that. We were made by Almighty God. So we have to build it up as we have been doing and to deal with the issue with Cain and where he got his wife, deal with the issue of Cain and how he knew his wife and understand that knowing his wife doesn't mean that he went to Nod and got to know her. He went to Nod and that is there that they had intercourse and she conceived when he knew her. Understand the idiomatic terms, we are building it up so that as we start to go into the other parts, now we just see everything connecting and coming together. And that is very important. Brothers and sisters, we call it uh, quits for the evening. God bless you. Again, thanks for being a part of Bible study. And when we meet again, we are going right into the gen genetics and simple genetics. And we're going to see how things unfold, how offspring come about, how, and when I say how they come about, you know, when they come about with the features that they have and how that has everything to do with a set of genes, a combination of genes that mother and father together have and the children they can have three children and they look a particular way and they can have 20 children and out of the 20 two brown brown 10 are dark how that happened why that happened have you ever seen that i'm going to show you some things and you will see how absolutely wonderful our god is and how absolutely awesome it is to see the thing coming out and to see the spread of people and to see why certain groups are at certain place, to see the climatic conditions and how it is an assist in a whole heap of things based on where the people eventually settled and who settled there, etc., etc., etc. It is going to come together. God's willing, next week, same time, we will get into that. Let us pray. We bless your name, mighty God. We thank you for another privilege to come before your presence. Continue to have us to learn from the book, the book of Genesis. Have us to come to a greater understanding, God, that you are Lord and that you are in charge and that you are the, the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is contained therein. We appreciate the study and I pray that you will just cement it in our hearts and in our minds and cement the fact that our God is in charge. We bless your name, bless your people, Keep us mighty God, hold us in the hallows of your hands and let your name be glorified. We give you thanks, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. The Lord richly bless you. Thank you again. And God's willing, next week we meet for Bible study. I'll see you all in church on Sunday and let's keep praying and let's come charged up to give glory and praise to the God of all gods and to the King of all kings. God bless you. See you in church on Sunday. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Praise God.